we're very honored to have a special individual uh, and uh, divulging all, I, I would say that we're not unknown to each other. Uh, we're actually friends, and so whatever that means for the methodology of it. Um, and could we just begin by asking you to state your name and also to spell it, in uh -huh. case in a hundred years people cannot read. There is an immediate question. My name, my nom de plume, or my <laughs> legal name. My, my name is Karen Knorr, K-N-O-R-R. But I write on the Nor Satina, which includes my maiden name. So, and that is C E T I N A. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And the reason that we're sitting here today is that uh, in in our presidential series, uh, this is the second interview that that we've done, and someday to, in, in perpetuity to go on the web. Um, why don't we just uh, start out by talking a little bit about your background and where you came from and what your okay. uh, early education was. How early? Very early? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, thank you, thank you, Wes, for, for having me here and for uh, giving me this opportunity. I grew up in Austria. I was born in a city called Graz. This is where, well, they may not know that in 50 years, Arnold Schwarzenegger came from. Same, same city, same background, same accent. Uh, I um, went to school there, but then went to university in Vienna. Uh, and right after, or even before I finished my PhD, my degree, I went to the so-called Institute for Advanced Study in Vienna. And this was an institution founded and financed in the beginning by the Ford Foundation, the American Ford Foundation. Um, that had been asked by emigres, Austrian emigres like Paul Lazarsfeld and Morgenstern and von Neumann to help the shattered social sciences after the war off the ground. And so the Ford Foundation gave money to Austria to set up a postgraduate institution and it was called Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and this I think was uh, quite a formative period for me in the formative institution. Uh, it, had the, it had the policy of uh, accepting scholars. First of all, there was a selection, so you felt privileged if you got in, <laughs> you got a scholarship. Uh, and it accepted scholars in the last stage of their dissertation and after that and appointed them for two years and you would get um, funding for two years and you were supposed to be there and finish your research and do some new research and listen to visiting professors who came to Austria from all over the world, mainly of course the United States and a little bit of France. But they came to the institute and gave uh, lectures for about a week or two weeks sometimes and, um, uh, and we, the so-called scholars, we were, were supposed to listen to them and learn from them. And it was very useful, I think. Uh, on the one hand, I got to know quite a number of famous American uh, social scientists, also economists, because the Institute had an economics department, a sociology department, and a political science department, and some computer science and statistics. But I, uh, we were able to go all to all of these lectures, and so I was able to get to know, for example, Aaron Sikuel, James Coleman, Peter Blau, uh, Rom Harley as a uh, philosopher, uh, and a number of others at the Institute, because they came and they gave us guest lectures, and, uh, and we, we got in touch with them, were able to talk to them, and so on. So, the Institute was very important. It was also important in another sense, and this is, this was the time after the student revolution in 1968. I was at the Institute until 78, I believe, from 1969, no, from 1971 onward, right. before I finished my PhD. And um, for two years as a scholar and then as an assistant professor. Uh, but what happened at the Institute is that we had the Austrian variety of that generation of 1968 politicized young students. 
for example, the son of the then minister, uh, 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 prime minister of Austria, Kreisky, the son of Kreisky and the daughter-in-law of Kreisky were in my generation at the institute. And there was a famous communist Fischer who had emigrated to Russia and then back to Austria. And his daughter was in my generation at the institute. And they were all very politicized student um, movement leaders. And I came to the institute as just a regular, <laughs> regular student from the university. I had not been part of the student movement. I had watched it a little bit and sympathized. But at the institute, I learned in the long run to um, hold my, hold my, how do you say in English, hold my position against them. Because these people were very skilled at arguing. And they would argue with you about everything. For example, I remember that at one point in time, I wanted to take a class on econometrics, quantitative methods. And they would instruct me, these were all people, my generation students, that quantitative met methods were really not what you should be studying. You should study qualitative methods. And, and I couldn't hold my own at that time. I didn't know how to argue with them because I didn't have enough knowledge. And I just thought, well, I mean, it's, it's something to look at. I don't know what it exactly is. Econometrics, I would like to look at that. But um, so I was uh, under their you know, powerful influence and argumentative influence for quite a while. Yeah, but they were students. They were, just they were also students. students. Yeah. They were senior. No, they were not senior. They were, they were my generation. But they uh, were, had been student leaders for a few years. And so they had learned to argue and to make a case and to persuade people. And I took that for a few years, two years or so, and then I got fed up with it. And I thought, this is not going to work with me forever. I don't want to. I don't want to be, um, I'll be say in, in, in German, we say untergebuttert. I don't want to be put down all the time and, and be told what I should do. And so I, you know, some of us teamed up or ganged up against them and ha then developed our own position. And the basic point is that at the Institute, I not only got to know um, American and British and uh, French uh, social scientists uh, of uh, some reputation, usually. Otherwise, they wouldn't be invited. But I also learned to argue. And I learned to develop the confidence to be able to do that. So then when I left the Institute in 1978 to go to the 76 it was to go to the United States. This was my first year in the US. Um, again, with the help of the Ford Foundation. So the um, Un American Foundation was really helpful in this. Um, I discovered the United States not as someone who was in a weak position, but as someone who was in already in a fairly strong position. I, I wasn't really afraid anymore. You know, If you survived the Institute, you could survive anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I came to Berkeley, for example, or to Columbia to give a talk, I, I, I was able to, um, to provide some counter power to these powerful American institutions. I went uh, with the help of the Ford Foundation to the United States to have a sort of sabbatical from my assistant professorship. And I had done a lot of quantitative research before coming. I, I was doing the Austrian part of a six-country UNESCO study on scientists in organizations. And uh, this study was um, led by an American social scientist, Frank Andrews, from the University of Michigan, who was uh, chairing uh, an international group of people, committee of people who were, were doing the study in six European countries. And I did the study for Austria. Uh, and I was very frustrated at the end of this study because I, I got a lot of correlations, but I never knew what they meant. It, it, they didn't make too much sense. They were in the order of 0.3. So you had 9% of the variance explained. 
which is nothing. My, my husband uh, uh, was a natural scientist, and I said, what are you looking at here? 9% of the variance explained. <laughs> Throw it out. And, uh, and if it had more, if the correlations were 0.5, then there was some tautology. Mm. I also did some of the interviews myself, and I was uh, having traumatic experience from these interviews because I had a standardized questionnaire. And I went to interview, for example, the head of the, uh, a very big steel corporation in Austria. And they did a lot of research. So I interviewed the head, and then I interviewed some scientists. And the head of the steel corporation wiped the standardized questionnaire from the table and said, well, it doesn't correspond to what I want to talk about, and it's not, the questions don't make sense to me. And then the scientists and technicians more or less said the same thing, because the, you cannot have a standardized questionnaire across all kinds of levels of uh, uh, social structure. It, it just doesn't work. These people don't understand the question in the same way. And I had come to all this with a very positivistic understanding of science as something that should be objective, you know, and it could be validated and so on. Uh, and I did the pilot interviews for the studies and then was really thrown off my guard by them. It was like a Levi-Straussian experience in the field. That you yeah, I, I will say, and I'm, I'm really injecting myself too much, sure. this, but that's when I first knew of your work and I read it, mm -hmm. those studies. Yeah. And I was in graduate school at the time. Uh -huh. And I also know that they did multiple questionnaires, not just a single questionnaire. Yes. They had different ones for the head of the research unit. But that was already a result of our pilot study work, oh. including my own, when we found oh. this that doesn't work. You know, you have to have different questionnaires. But the problem sort of remained that people would negotiate with you. It's like if I present you with a standardized questionnaire, now you're a trained social scientist, you may say, okay, forget it, I will just do what she asks me to do. But these people were starting to negotiate. You know? They said, are you satisfied with your salary? Are you satisfied with the technology you have available? They would say, how do you mean that technology? In what sense? You know? And you had to elaborate and so on. So um, when I came to Berkeley, I was really looking for an alternative because I was frustrated with this large-scale quantitative study, which had cost me a lot of time. I did um, sophisticated Liswell models. I started again, sorry. And then I, um, but I thought um, I'm not going to use this year to continue that and do more publications. I need to do something else. And at that time, Kuhn's uh, Structure of Scientific Revolution had already been out. I had been very interested in science because we also had, in, not only in Austria, in Germany, in a number of countries in Europe, England, so-called, um, um, what was it? It was almost a, a debate over positivism. And it brought into play the natural sciences and how they do things and whether the social sciences should imitate that or should not imitate that. Habermas was involved, Luhmann was involved, Popper was involved, Lakatos was involved. Uh, and we had fights over that at various meetings uh, and big discussions on that at my institute. So I um, had this interest in science, uh, but I think if I hadn't gone, gone to California, I would probably not have done a lab study because the Austrian context seems to me to be after the fact to have been too conservative and too traditional and you wouldn't do something as foolish as a lab study in that context. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. may have to tell the, the viewer that, uh, you, that, you, that you were pretty well known for lab studies or you know, something along those lines. Yeah, well, I, I did. I did. I st so when I came to Berkeley, I embarked on my first laboratory studies, study trying to uh, pick up on this issue of how does science really work. And I wanted to get into the Lawrence Livermore lab, but they wouldn't let me in because I was not, not an um, American citizen. And that was a requirement. Then I was able to actually through opportunistic through my husband who was at the at a research center there, 
to get access to that research center. And I just asked the scientist, I didn't ask the top of the institution anymore, could I come in and watch? And I didn't expect anything to come from that, really. I thought science, after all, must be somewhere located in the head, in thinking. And what would I see? And, um, but I tried it. And, and then after I tried it, I, I was hooked immediately because he, he, I, see it was an, I saw it was an action system. And you could see everything. There wasn't more thinking going on than in everyone else's head. It, it was not a thinking discipline. And you could very well hide in a corner and watch. You were not obtrusive. They would explain things to you. They felt flattered you know, that someone would take them serious. And they were very open and gave me their papers and all that. And so uh, I was really, uh, on that first day, coming out of the lab with the feeling that's what I want to do. And uh, even though I had gone into the lab thinking, this is foolish, it makes no sense, you, you're crazy, what are you doing here? You what year? should go home. <laughs> that was in the fall of 1976. And it was uh, shortly before the 4S meeting happened. And before S, the first 4S meeting, it was the first meeting, I think, the found, founding meeting, uh, was very important because Bruno Latour was there and talked about his work in Southern California. And I was there, I can't remember what I talked about, but I felt, I, got out of this meeting and felt tremendously you know, enthusiastic about uh, this sort of research. Uh, uh, apparently not only I, but several were, were doing that reinforced my interest. And it, um, uh, and it gave me that feeling there is a community in the background that's interested in that. I was also proud to be a founding member. I mean, I was young then, so it was a, a special thing, and, and um, I liked the society, I liked the people there, but this was still a time when all kinds of people were there. The, the Mertonian School was there, and Diana Crane was there, I remember, but Bruno was also there. And after that meeting, I uh, went to talk with Bruno, and we set up a special conference. We met in Berkeley, and then we met in San Diego. Uh, at least two or three times during that year, and exchanged um, what we were doing and exchanged opinions and talked a lot. Uh, and at the time, I didn't know Michael Lynch or <coughs> Sharon Travik, who perhaps started a little later with their lab studies. Uh, but um, so this was a very reinforcing and enhancing experience, the 4S meeting. Uh, I think I would have continued, of course, doing that without the 4S meeting, but I wouldn't have known anyone. I would, I would have been on my own. And with the 4S meeting and the contacts established at that meeting, I could, uh, I could have these other meetings in San Diego, and I could uh, talk to someone, and, and all that was very important. And when you, uh, I'm just curious, if there's, you, you remember a number of different communities, but. And I know you're you're active in the, the sociological associations mm -hmm. as well. How how does throughout your career how did 4S fit in in that in that circle of associations? Well, it, I think it became it became my primary community because I was um, before when I did the six country study that was already a study of scientists and organizations. And I probably talked about that at the 4S meeting because that these studies were finished and I had data. Uh, so I, I saw myself as someone studying science. And then you had an additional label. You had you know, Society for Social Studies of Science. I don't know whether we actually gave us this name right in the beginning, but we had, we had an association of, of similarly interested people and, and it was certainly the first time that I had that. Before that, I had been at some sociology meetings in Germany and Austria, and maybe at one in the United States, just briefly. I think just at one. 
and uh, I, I felt I was a sociologist. I was in the sociology department, but I didn't particularly like many of the concerns sociology had, uh, which doesn't say anything about the concerns, which are perfectly valid, important. It says something about me. I wasn't interested in social structure, in social class, the concept of role, and you know all these things, even though I w was interested in Goffman and Sicurel, but I had more of a micro-sociological stance. I, I also had studied anthropology at the university, so uh, sociology was only my second subject. Mm -hmm. And I only did sociology primarily at the Institute for Advanced Study because they didn't have an anthropology. And the anthropology in Vienna was uninteresting. It was historical. And it didn't challenge me, and it wasn't, it wasn't really any fun. So I, already at the university, I switched to sociology to some degree, but I didn't like the discipline particularly. And I had a time when I was thinking of you know, studying something else in addition, because I didn't like sociology enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but then came the science studies involvement, uh, and a lot of communication about science already in Vienna, and then through the Society for Social Studies of Science. Well, maybe you could just give us a like a two-sentence overview of where you spent your career as far as institutionally, so that we can kind of get the overview. Yeah, I studied in Vienna. Uh, I was then an assistant professor. I apologize, but I talked too much for three days. So. Uh, I have hardly any voice left. Um, so then I spent um, uh, from 1971 until 1978 first as a scholar and then as an assistant professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Vienna. And we were called assistant professors. 76 uh, 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 to 77, I had a year off. I went to Berkeley for this laboratory study, came back, finished the study and then tried to find a job because th these were limited, um, uh, time-limited appointments. You couldn't uh, get tenure at the institute for a longer period of time. Austria had no jobs, and I was frustrated with Austria anyway. So uh, we uh, went to the United States with scholarship, both my husband and I, scholarship money at first. Then he got a position in Cornell, and I got a position at Virginia Tech. And uh, um, that was after a period of uh, scholarship for two years, so let me start again. 78, I left Austria, went to the United States, had soft money for one to two years, and in 1981, I believe, I got the appointment at Virginia Tech. Uh, had, had the time to finish more work on my laboratory data and presented that work, and people were very interested, so I, Virginia Tech invited me, and I went there for a year. It was a visiting appointment. But after that year, or towards the end of the year, I got three other um, 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 offers from um, Wesleyan University, from Carnegie Mellon, and from Virginia Tech to stay there. I took the appointment that promised me the highest position, <laughs> Wesleyan University, and went there. I think I was there only two years or so. I, I didn't like the undergraduate um, focus at Wesleyan. And uh, uh, also wasn't sure we had uh, a, a second child, I think, by that time. So I wasn't sure whether we wanted to bring our children up in the United States or not. We had originally gone you know, for a while, but not forever. And uh, I got an appointment offer from the University of Bielefeld in Germany and took it. And my husband followed after uh, it took a while for him to find uh, a position in Germany, but we went back. So we went to the United States and then we went back to Germany. 
but I continued and then in Germany I basically had just a few positions, Bielefeld, first as a uh, associate professor, then as a full professor, and then I went from Bielefeld to the University of Constance. So there were no more, um, no big changes. I was in Bielefeld for almost 20 years or more than 20 years. And so you went to Constance when? Uh, 2001. And I was I was getting bored with Bielefeld. I was thinking in in the German system you cannot switch universities after you are even 55 because because of the system we don't have to go into that. And I felt I need a change. I didn't at the time really think I would go back definitely to the United States because the we had three three children and you know it's difficult to manage that sort of career and and they. My husband didn't want to leave and had a good position in Berlin, so um, even though I had come back to the States several times for sabbaticals, but I didn't think I would go back for good. I had had several position offers from the States, but I didn't in the end take them, mainly because we couldn't manage it with the family. I think we would have needed a dual appointment and were, I think, too timid to uh, simply ask for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was also difficult because he was in food biotechnology and there's not that many universities which are good in that area. So I stayed in Germany and then took the Constance position just to, because uh, I feel when you are at one university too long, uh, it gets too um, routinized and you don't see anything new anymore and you can't, uh, the people, everything gets a, sort of used up a bit. <laughs> and I guess that would be me. <laughs> one job. I just had one job in my whole life. Not everybody feels like that, I assume, but I felt I need a change. So, uh, and Constance asked me, I didn't really apply, they asked would I be interested and I said, yeah, why not? Uh, it looks funny. And so I went to Constance, but at the same time, I had, uh, I had already had conversations with Columbia about a possible position before I left for Constance. And so I knew that perhaps at some point, you know, when the kids are out of the house, I would like to go back to the States. And um, asked Bielefeld and asked Constance, could, would it be possible to, to have some sort of leave policy so that I could be away for a while? every year. Columbia didn't work out really and um, then Chicago came at some point in 2003. Uh, I had given a talk in Chicago, uh, just a talk at some workshop, but then they asked me would I be interested. Chicago is always recruiting, you know, it's a terrible because you always have to be on these recruitment uh, committees and it's really a lot of work. So they asked me and I felt, why not? I mean, I was really attracted to Chicago because of the Chicago school reputation. I was not so attracted perhaps to the place in the beginning because Constance is really nicely located. You know, I'm overlooking a lake and it's a beautiful environment. But then I thought, okay, beauty is not the issue, intellectual, <laughs> intellectual cleverness is the issue, and Chicago clearly is interesting for me. And I said yes, and then I had this dual appointment until now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, we're about halfway through the tape, so. And we uh, haven't well, spoken. Well, yeah, do, do we want to focus on, <coughs> on the shutdown? Okay, so we got the institutional the mm -hmm. career, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you you brought us up to the point of laboratory studies and microsociology and uh, really kind of the early '80s. I think that's yeah. where we are now. Yeah. What what's happened since then? It's a broad question. <laughs> well, I think something still happened in Berkeley, which needs to be mentioned um, um, more than one thing. Actually, the first was. Uh, to develop this constructivist perspective. 
And I distinctly remember that I didn't take that from anyone, not from Berger and Lockman, which I somehow had known, but I hadn't paid much attention to it, I think. But that I came home, I, I was in the lab in Berkeley, and uh, at one point in uh, trying to make sense of what was going on, and having a lot of trouble with that, and sitting in the library part of the time, withdrawing off and on from the field to think about that and work on my notes. And uh, at one point having that idea that what is going on here is a process of construction. And then I published an article on that, and this constructivist, then that concept got elaborated and developed over time but it came out of my lab experience. And if you look at the first study of Bruno Latour, uh, for example, a laboratory life, he's actually citing me for the constructivist notion. So I, I think it's important that in science studies, science studies, I believe, did not, and I think others in science studies also did not simply take over <laughs> a paradigm that already existed in sociology, but rediscovered rediscovered a, 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 a form of reality making in their interaction with, uh, Harry Collins didn't because he looked at controversies, but those of us who did lab studies, they discovered that in, in the process of doing their lab studies. Uh, and it was also a form of constructivism that was not very like Berger and Luckmann because Berger and Luckmann if you remember them, had this idea about how our reality becomes conventionalized and, and their form of constructivism was on a much uh, more abstract level. Uh, and then it was about legitimation and routinization and conventionalization of something and of hardening something. Uh, but I think that was not the most important thing, certainly not for me. For me, the important thing was to to actually uh, 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 not, I didn't see the consensus formation process really. Well, that, what I saw is the production process of knowledge. And to find a term that would allow you a sensitizing concept that would allow you to then, uh, you could work with it and it would allow you to, to look at reality, you know, with this lens and see more than you had seen before. So for example, once I had the concept, then I watched them writing their papers and I saw that they're producing seven or nine versions, which one of the papers I looked at closely, in various drafts that, that, that were immediately discarded. You could see that process of constructing a, a knowledge claim. Let's not call it a fact, but a knowledge claim, sort of literally, you know, how, how it worked in paper writing. And the notion of construction was quite important there. And it accompanied me for the next, well, even until today. Though today perhaps I'm, I'm, uh, I still think very much that reality is accomplished and that this process of accomplishing has its own logic, dynamics. And if you don't follow it, uh, you are missing something about what's going on. If you only look at the output, you know, you don't understand what's going on. And you have, to, you have to look at the dynamic and mechanisms in this process of construction or accomplishment, if you want to use an ethnometodological term. It's also a term I only we discovered later, I think, in, in interaction perhaps with Michael Lynch. So um, constructivism came, came out of the lab and was important. And the other thing that came out of the lab was not so much maybe ethnography per se, because I don't see myself as uh, primarily an ethnographer. I would not use the method at any time if I, if I had reason not to use it. Uh, it was more that you would be able uh, in, th th that science studies in the beginning had I think two or three or four strategies for getting access to a reality that was not available before that. One was to look at controversies. That's what Harry Collins did. At, in, during controversies, you can see things that you don't see once they are closed. Hmm. Uh, the other was to go and look at laboratories, at the production process. 
But during that production process, you really needed observation. You needed ethnography because the scientists would not be able to tell you what they are doing. Or they would give you some sort of, a, you know, sort of thing they write in their papers about what happened in the research process, and you didn't see the action system. It was not present in their thinking. Sometimes it comes up, you know, when they have conflicts, but it wasn't present. So you needed, you could not do interviews. You needed a methodology that would allow you to actually watch things as an observer, uh, sometimes participating, but it wasn't necessary to participate a, a lot in that sort of reality. You really had to focus on watching and understanding. And so that came out of the first lab study, and both things were very important for me in the future until today because I had the sense that with this methodology, if I go and look at the process in which this reality is accomplished, in which these things are being made, then I can see things others just never see. You know? And it's also theoretically interesting. Whereas much of my quantitative work had not been and that was one of the main frustrations. It had not been theoretically interesting because you had to have the hypothesis before you do the survey, the, the questionnaire. And if you had the wrong hypothesis or didn't know enough, we simply didn't know enough, you didn't come up with good hypotheses. And then the standardization also compresses this in, you know, in the length of the, the material, the infrastructure of doing survey research forces you hmm, to limit yourself to one hour or half an hour or 20 minutes. Uh, and then you have standardized questionnaire in order to be able to do a quantitative analysis. And it doesn't let reality emerge as it really is. So it was, I found it theoretically uninteresting. When we had correlations, as I said before, I didn't really know why we had the correlations and what it meant. And they shouldn't have been there. And they were there. And where we should have found some, they were not there. And so this was not frustrating on the empirical level because I turned out, you can always turn out papers, but it was frustrating on a real level of understanding and on a theoretical level. I did not feel I really learned something about the reality. Whereas in that first lab study, I had the feeling I learned a tremendous lot. Unbelievable what I learned. I have a completely new view of science <laughs> emerged you know, before me. So that was very important. The other thing was very important was the communication. I think we, we should not ignore that with other people doing, having similar interests, even though not always the same. These people were Bruno Latour, uh, 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 Steve Wolger, Harry Collins, all these first new sociologists of science, David Blower and others. So you were in a circle of people who discussed things from somewhat different angles and with a somewhat different methodology, but basically with the same, with the same interest of opening up the, the black box of science and looking at it empirically and taking the questions from philosophy, how does science work and run and do, do the same thing but with an empirical methodology. So some, some sort of an empirical philosophy really we did or some people called it anthropology. But it wasn't anthropology in the sense of using anthropological concepts a lot. You know, the notion ritual, you know, symbolic, a lot of notions did not, were not imported uh, into our field. Because the questions, the real questions, were actually philosophical. How, how does science work? What's the epistemic nature of the beast? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that continued to interest me. And one, certainly one area that has always fascinated me, whereas other questions about science, which are equally legitimate and important, practically important, uh, uh, the question, questions Andy Abbott asks, you know, looking at science as a profession, never interested me somehow. I wasn't so much interested in careers and in all, uh, or not in institutions and not in organizations. <laughs> but in the actual content, the structures within the content, making of the content. Uh, and that, that, I think, remained with me until today. And I only, today what happens is that I apply it to financial markets. I go on the trading floor 
and I see not just uh, the organizations and social relations, this is what economic sociology sees. It sees markets as organizations uh, interlinked in some sort of network structures. And that's far too abstract an approach for me, or it, it's not wrong, but it doesn't get at the molecular level of things. And the molecular level of actual trading you know, that sort of thing you see when you go on the laboratory level, on the, on the trading floor level. And uh, uh, so uh, I think there has been one big shift in my uh, intellectual makeup that was going away from the uh, quantitative studies in which I had hoped to believe and, and had wanted to have faith but lost faith <laughs> and lost interest because they were unrewarding on a theoretical level and empirically um, unplausible, not really satisfying with these low correlations. This does not mean that I would not now suggest we need to include quantitative indicators where appropriate and need to use them, but it meant that I myself wanted to do something that was more interesting. So the shift was then to do uh, um, constructivist laboratory studies and use constructivism not just as a um, general perspective, but also as a sensitizing concept that would allow me to, to uh, understand, to see more in empirical reality. I did that, um, uh, uh, I did carry that with me, and then the only other shift, two other shifts happened, I think. One was to go from uh, an attention to fact construction that was the first lab studies uh, because of the discussions we, we had with philosophers. We were all interested in, in you know, how do you, what, what's happening to these knowledge claims? How do they come about? Well, how are they constructed, if you wish? And um, I came up with certain answers about the interaction system, the negotiations, and and the um, uh, mechanisms in the lab, the opportunism, for example mechanisms in the lab that made that fact construction, that would shed light on the fact construction. But then uh, when I did the comparative study, that, that was um, um, uh, maybe 10 years later, I started in 86, 87 to do CERN and molecular biology, but it took me quite a while to finish the study. So it wasn't published until 1999 uh, um, the um, empirical research didn't take so long, but then the writing and so on did take a while. Uh, and then the shift I made then is that I became more interested in the routines. I was confronted with huge collaborations. I think the field was again important in injecting its structure <laughs> into your thinking. You went to the lab, I always went to the labs, clueless. I really didn't know what was going on before I went there. I never found a way to know that well before going there, because even if you read the literature, this sort of stuff is not in the literature. So I went to CERN again relatively clueless, what is high energy physics actually doing? And then I saw these huge collaborations and the huge detectors and the matching of the two. And I think that also had an influence on me in uh, shifting me away from the actual construction of facts, which would have been difficult to see in even a 10-year study because the experiments take 20 years. To the question, what are the routines? What are the conventions? What are the practices in the sense of the conventional mechanisms and routines, or as I call it, the machineries of knowledge construction, rather than uh, to address the question, how is a single fact constructed? So I switched not away from the methodology, not away from the general interest, but I switched uh, one notch up in terms of the level of analysis to looking at um, how can you characterize a particular science in terms of its um, mechanisms, understandings, and practices. 
That then meant, and I didn't go in the lab with the notion culture in mind, but again, the notion culture was an outcome of this interest because at one point in time, I, I was thinking, okay, I'm, what I'm seeing here is different cultures. So this was a shift, but not a radical shift, I think. Mm -hmm. And the third shift was to study financial markets, always on an empirical level. And that shift came about uh, from uh, well, I, I had finished the second laboratory study. It was a major enterprise. I remained very interested, and in, even today, I'm very interested in physics. But um, uh, I read too much of the New York Times at the time, I think, and I saw on the uh, first pages, not in the business pages, all kinds of things about financial things, mergers, acquisition, trading, you know, things were there, and I, I, I remember that I was struck by the metaphoric language they used. You know, always, almost a language like in outer space sometimes. Yeah, and this was in the, the late 90s? No, that, that was in the, that was, yes. Mm -hmm. 97, 96, I was in Princeton for a sabbatical in 97. I was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton in 92 for a year. And I had occasion to be in the States to read the New York Times and to, uh, to, to let it influence me. And I just became interested in that. I didn't have time to actually study it. And because I was clueless, uh, I wrote a grant proposal with my colleague Alex Prader at the University of Bielefeld at the time for a financial market study, and it wasn't financed because I really didn't know what I was doing. It was justifiably not financed. I just had that interest, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but then uh, another stroke of luck, I, I think I've had many strokes of luck in my academic intellectual life happened, and that is a former trader, Urs Brugger, came to me in Bielefeld uh, and said he was going to do a dissertation on on the markets in which he was still part of which he was still part. He was still working on the trading floor, and he was looking for someone to to guide him, to provide some guidance or feedback or something, even though he wasn't even doing the dissertation in Bielefeld. And he had heard that I was interested in financial markets, and so he presented what he was interested in, and I was immediately. Uh, very, very taken by that and thought, okay, let's go on the trading floor. And it was again this sort of hooking, you know. <laughs> I went on the trading floor in Zurich, the one on which he worked, and it was possible because he worked there, otherwise I wouldn't have gotten in. And again, I thought, that that's it, that's fantastic. This is highly technological. Uh, it's also apparently global uh, because they were not talking with each other. They were talking with, you know, London and Sydney and Singapore and, and New York. And, uh, and it um, is fascinating. It's, it's an epitome of postmodern culture. It, it was really giving me a postmodern impression, not modernity. Uh, you know, I also teach social theory, so I knew something about modernization theory and modernity and had the feeling modernity is, uh, is associated with industrialization. This was not industrialization. This was all electronic. It was about something completely different. And even though I didn't understand what it was about in the beginning, uh, I had the feeling uh, it's, it's that sort of uh, um, hunch you have. You know, this, you, you better go and look at that. So uh, I was able, with the help of this um, colleague of mine, uh, Urs Brugger, to, uh, to get on the trading floors and to um, take that on board and to start doing that. Well, that is a good, uh, we are about Finished? 12, 12 minutes left. Uh -huh. Do you want to talk any about 4S? Yeah, well, 4S. 4S had this, I think, original, initial, and very important uh, um, impact on me, the 1976 meeting. It was formative. 
And I think it was formative not only for me, but for a number of others who were there and were inspired by what go went on at the meeting, by the possibility of a new field emerging under your gaze and with your help. This is incredibly motivating, I think, especially for young people who are looking for a project and a program and, and they see it's happening and this is it and nobody has done that. Uh, and um, now, of course, at the time 4S was still uh, incorporating many others, uh, the Mertonian School and so on and so forth. Uh, but we had then, uh, I think, in the context of 4S or stimulated by what happened at 4S, uh, a number of other meetings and special meetings with the Merton School, for example, or among us and against the Merton School, all that was foolish after the fact, but it helped. It helped. It's important in constituting a field, I think, that you, uh, that you differentiate yourself from a previous field and area. And that happened partly in the context of 4S, so the Mertonian School at least was kind of, this is what you were against, more or less, or? Yeah, we decided we were against that, you know. We, and it's not clear that we knew what we were, <laughs> very well, what, why we should be against that. But, but at the time, Merton was associated with Parsons, and Parsons was criticized generally in sociology for his, you know, normative view of society, which didn't seem plausible any longer. There had been critiques. And Merton was just, you know, put in the same uh, pot with Parsons and uh, discarded, discredited, not treated well, I think, now, because there were some quite interesting things in the Merton School that we should continue to look at. And I actually continue to teach it, but the rhetoric was against that school. And that played a role in forming the new sociology of science, and a lot of that happened in the context of 4S. So this is how 4S was, I think, intellectually important. Because it framed, it provided a framework for these discussions. It allowed uh, people like Harry Collins, David Bloor, Barry Barnes, a number of others, you know, Steve Shapin, Donald McKenzie, mm -hmm. me, Sharon Travick, Michael Lynch, uh, this, this sort of first generation of scholars. Uh, to come together and talk and make presentations, talk to each other routinely, every year. Mm -hmm. Not just uh, once in a while when someone had the money to invite you, but routinely. It drew in others, philosophers, remember that some of these meetings were together with philosophical and historical associations. So we had the opportunity in this framework with the other societies to attack philosophers. Philosophers had the opportunity to attack us. We won over some philosophers. And uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, interaction with historians because they came to 4S or the societies met together. And I think in that sense, the society was in extremely instrumental, not just as an institution, but as a, as a framework for uh, and an infrastructure for uh, helping a new field off the ground. That's what it did. But now the people coming in now, um, well, I'll just ask this and I'll ask if you want to ask anything. The people coming in now, they cannot have that same sense of excitement mm -hmm. as you did yes. because it wasn't, it's not a new field anymore. Yeah. I don't know well, if that's a question, but. Yeah, it's, it's a routinization process. It happens to all societies, I think. You have to think, if you think in, in generations, then the second generation, and especially maybe the third generation, is uh, not confronted with the same opportunities anymore, though I think they are, uh, but sometimes they don't recognize it. Um, um, the ferment, the, the debates, the fights, because in the beginning of 4S there were a lot of fights, helped us, I think, to structure research and to, to do research in a way that, that then proved to be somewhat, let's say, foundational. Uh, it's very difficult to do that in the second or third generation. 
you can do it, but you have to create this same sense of we are off to something interesting. I think what, for example, personally think that, that people could if they moved away a little bit from the single case studies, which leads people to do fragmented stuff, you know, that there's no meta, no one, hardly anyone looks at these case studies and tries to bring them together and draw them some conclusions for them. But if you did more system, if you got the funding, because it's a funding issue, for more systematic comparative studies with all the problems they have, but nonetheless, I mean, you've done them, so you know all about that. Uh, more systematic studies uh, of particular issues, not just epistemic issues, but also epistemic issues. I mean, the question of evaluative cultures links content issues. How do you do the evaluation uh, with uh, rating issues with social conventions? So you would do that uh, on a larger scale and I think you could have a tremendous impact. It would be new and you could have a tremendous impact on uh, policy and funding agencies and other social sciences by doing it. Uh, but um, you would have to do that. Um, you, the, the, the young generations would have to find subjects that don't you know, let them be stuck in, in, in very detailed single studies. The comparative case studies that you're talking about. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So multi-sided, multi-country. Yeah, but to do a multi-sided study well, I, I believe in multi-sidedness, but I don't very much believe that single individuals can do good multi-sided studies because it forces them out of the content. Either you just look at the relationships or you just can't manage to do it in a, in a one or two or three year field study. It's too much to do. So you have to find methodologies and we, at the time we were simply lucky, I think, to discover <laughs> issues that were methodologically manageable, to discover methodologies that we could apply and that, that um, that uh, proved to be very fruitful if you applied them in a particular way. But I mean, you have to look at what Harry Collins did with looking at controversies. He didn't just, you know, study controversies in, in some sense. He looked at very crucial epistemic questions hmm, and used it for that purpose. This tape must be out by now. Um, just a, we got a couple, couple more minutes. I was just gonna ask if, if you can think of, you mentioned how the sort of internal arguments and fights were important to uh -huh. creative excitement. Yeah. Do, do you see any current kind of, you know, sort of similar fights or arguments in the field that you see, you know, could be generating the next wave of excitement or FPM? Well, we have become in all societies, I know, except philosophers, very politically correct. So we don't fight, we don't say this is crap. Sometimes I, I feel when I sit in a, uh, in a session, I feel like saying, look, it's, it's not working like that. You're just doing the first step. Where are the results? It would be really offensive, but then I don't do it. So we would have to, I think, um, provide more occasions. It's easier across disciplines. It was easier to fight with philosophers. Hmm? Because, because they, <laughs> they were not our in-group. Even at the time, and at the time we didn't hesitate. Harry Collins didn't hesitate to fight with Bruno Latour. Uh, you will notice that this first generation, none of them does the same thing. Yeah? We, we stuck to, I am not, I don't do actor network theory, and Harry Collins doesn't do it, and Harry Collins doesn't do laboratory studies. So we all stuck to our own. <laughs> and fought with each other about these things. And um, so you have to admit fighting. You, um, you have to set up, stage them, I think. So you mean really politically correct in the sense of, of, of uh, ac academically too sort of generous? And, yes, and, and that's not just not this control. society, that's also uh, sociology in general. So people have to be, uh, I mean, you should be constructive, it's correct, but occasionally you need a bloodbath. 
because a bloodbath <laughs> excites the audience, and the audience takes positions, and the audience um, looks into the matter, follows up on it, and I, I think it's, so. If you become too too um, um, too loving to each other, mm. then sometimes that doesn't create the same excitement. Yeah, well, I'll make a few comments after we show, run the tape out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on that. that I can't probably say on camera. <laughs> but uh, I wonder, is there anything that, um, I think we should continue this at another time because you know maybe we haven't covered all the things we should. Yeah. But um, is there any, uh, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, certainly, um, 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 to be obsessed with science is uh, to be obsessed with the field of study that you have is very important and is very helpful. If you don't have a project by which you are eaten up, let's say, almost, then it's very much more difficult to produce good, good results. So that's, for example, one, one issue. The other is to really think about research designs. I mean, they will know that. Anyone knows that abstractly. But that, uh, to, to have a design, like to, 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 to know that in order to understand science, you need to go in the lab, which seems obvious now, but was not at all obvious at the time. Nobody believed in it. Hmm? Or that you need to look at controversies, and you can do that. So to have a research design where the method is adequate uniquely adequate to the questions you ask is very important in many natural sciences and less important often in sociology where we think, okay, we, we know how to do questionnaires, so we do that. But if the questionnaires can be very adequate for a number of things because people talk and they can answer, but they are not adequate for everything. So, so to have a clever research design is very important and I think by a stroke of luck, we, we sort of had it, and we, we were helped by in this in the beginning.